So let us start with lecture two, and this is about Taylor series and quadratic forms, and both these concepts will become very useful for optimization. So essentially, this is the Taylor series of a simple single variable function f of x. And here we have expanded this at the point x is equal to x star. So if we do this, we get the Taylor series in this form here. So you get the first term is simply f of x at x star. Then you have the first derivative x minus x star half, the second derivative x minus x star square. And then there are a plethora of terms which are beyond this point, which we call as h o t. Now, this Taylor series expansion is taken at the point x is equal to x star, and therefore it is valid for x close to x star. So the important point to remember is that when we are using a truncated Taylor series expansion, which is essentially using, let us say, the first two uh, terms here involving the first two derivatives, then this is only going to be valid in the neighborhood of the point x star. Now, Taylor series basically will find out an approximate function, which is essentially a polynomial for a given nonlinear function, and this will be around a given point. Now, for most functions, if you take an infinite number of terms in the Taylor series, you will converge. But what is expedient as far as optimization is concerned is that the first few terms, typically the first two terms, can capture the behavior of a function locally. Now, there is a special case of Taylor series which happens when x star is equal to zero, and this is sometimes known as the Maclaurin series, which is given here. Now, we can rewrite the Taylor series in a form which is more suitable for optimization. To do this, let us say that there is a small change d, which is defined as x minus x star. So essentially here we are making the approximation that this point x is in the neighborhood of x star. Now, we can write this Taylor series here, which was in terms of x and x star, in terms of only x star and d by using this particular fact. So we replace the x by x star plus d here, and then all these x minus x stars are replaced by d here. So this basically cleans up the equation, which is the classical Taylor series, and you can now write it in terms of this small d. Now, if we expand this to the realm of two variables, then the Taylor series becomes something like this. So here again, you have the first term, which is the function value at x1 star, x2 star. You have the derivative terms, two of them here, and then you have the second derivative terms, and now you have three of these terms here. And again, all these derivatives and this function are calculated at the point x1 star and x2 star. And essentially, the Taylor series will change if these points change for a function. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, if we look closely at this and try to write this in summation form, we will see that this particular term is a gradient type of term. So all these df by dx1, or let's call it dou f by dou x1, are essentially components of gradients. And these second derivative terms are essentially components of the Hessian matrix, which you will recall from the last lecture. Now, essentially, we do not like to carry on this kind of summation notation because it is very cumbersome to write and uh, think about. Therefore, we try to keep all things in matrix notation. So here, if we look at the Taylor series in matrix notation for a function of n variables, then we can express it in this form here. So again, you see here, the first term is here f of x star, then you have the gradient term, and then you have the Hessian term here, and then you have all the remaining terms which we will neglect most of the time. Now, again, going with our definition of d being x minus x star, and now all these are vectors, so they are in bold letters, you can write this x as x star plus d, and therefore all this becomes in terms of d which looks much nicer. And so you have a very compact form of this Taylor series expansion, which is now expressed in matrix form. 
Now you can also clearly see why the gradient vector, which is here, and the Hessian matrix are very important in optimization because very often we will consider this kind of approximation for a typical function. So now let us look at the change in function value. So essentially the change in function value is this delta f, which is f of x star plus t minus f of x star. And so therefore the Taylor series becomes this particular equation. And here we can now write this, this minus this as delta f and delta f becomes this year. So again, a further compact notation which lets us write this entire change of function in a very simple form. So this is something which we are going to come back to repeatedly in both one dimensional and multidimensional situations. So essentially this change of optimization is used in many change of function is used in many optimization situations to guide the method in a particular direction. So now we will move to something different and we will then relate it back to some of the things in the Taylor series and this is known as quadratic forms. So essentially in optimization we consider general nonlinear functions. But before we get into this general nonlinear functions and because it is difficult to create theories around general nonlinear functions, most of the theories in optimization are developed for a special class of functions which are quadratics. And so to formalize this quadratic, we will call this as quadratic form. And therefore this knowledge of quadratic form will become very important in deriving some of the methods which we have for optimization. So one of the reasons why quadratics are very important is that most optimization algorithms are developed for quadratic functions. And once we find they work very well for quadratic functions, we can set these uh, methods onto general nonlinear functions. And this approach generally works well because if you think in terms of a graphical form or in terms of your uh, general plotting of functions, you will note that most nonlinear functions will be quadratic in a local sense. So if you go to any point x star and you just zoom into that particular point, you will see the function will look like a quadratic. So the quadratic form is something like this here, f of x, and you can see it has all these square type of terms. So you can have x1 square, x2 square, x3 square, and then you can have terms which are multiples of x1, x2, x2, x3, x3, x1. So this is essentially a quadratic form. Now you can immediately like the, write this in a summation notation here, where we have put this coefficient pij, xi, xj, and then i is summed one to n, j is summed one to n. So this would be a mathematically general expression for a quadratic form. Now what we do is we expand out this particular quadratic form in this manner, where we retain the square term and then we write out all these uh, x1, x2, x2, x1, xn type of term, the second uh, term, you know, set of terms, the third, and so on till the nth one. So essentially, if we were to expand out the this uh, particular summation here, both of these, you, we would get something like this. Okay. And what we are going to do now is we are going to capture all the square terms in one place and to then look at all the x1, x2 type of terms in a second place. So before we do that, let us write this quadratic form in matrix notation. So let us say y is px and p is an n by n matrix x and y are vectors. Then I can write this quadratic form here in this form because I have defined y is px. Essentially this y comes here. And then if I write it in matrix notation, I get half xty because you can see here that this is basically a scalar or a dot product. And so I can write it in this form. And then again, you go back here, you bring back y here, you get half xtpx. So essentially the quadratic form is something like this where x is a vector and p is a matrix. And very often in different fields such as mechanics, you will see uh, terms which come out in this particular form. Okay, so that is all essentially quadratic forms. So now let's split this quadratic form in a certain manner so as we can bring out a symmetric matrix of the quadratic form. Because there can be general P matrix, but we will try to find a symmetric matrix. So essentially what we do, we write out Fx such that all the square terms are here. 
and then all the x1 x2 type of terms are all here okay so once we have done that then what we are going to do is separate these square terms out and then we are going to fix these particular diagonal terms so when i is not equal to j so these are all the non diagonal terms here the coefficient of xi xj is pij plus pji so what we do is we define aij as half of pij plus pji and therefore aij plus aji is pij plus pji so therefore you will see that by this particular definition my fx is half xt px is equal to half xt ax but now because i have uh, split this p matrix into a manner such that the ij and the ji terms carry the same value this matrix has essentially become a symmetric matrix so the value of the quadratic form does not change when p is replaced by a but a is symmetric and you can prove it like this aij is this value aji is this value so you simply flip i and j here to get this and these are both same as you can see here therefore this is a symmetric matrix and as far as the diagonal terms are concerned they are also same so aii is equal to pii now there are many p matrices which are possible because i can have various combinations of aij and pij uh, of uh, pij and pji which are different but there is only one a matrix for the quadratic form because once we impose symmetry we get that particular situation now why this is done is that symmetric matrices are more useful in terms of getting insight into the problem and we shall soon see why that is so so essentially let us remember that the quadratic form can be written in terms of a symmetric matrix and then you have half xt ax now this form of the matrix can be used to define certain important characteristics of the quadratic form so the matrix a can be classified depending on the sign of the quadratic form so for example if the quadratic form is in this form less than or equal to 0 and this is valid for all x except at least one x not equal to 0 with x t a x equal to 0 then this particular quadratic form or matrix associated with the quadratic form is negative semi definite now if this less than becomes uh, strict then it becomes negative definite similarly you have positive semi definite if it is greater than equal to 0 and it is positive definite if it is greater than 0 excluding certain conditions such as x is 0 and so on now the indefinite condition comes when this quadratic form can be positive for some x and negative for some x now you will see that many physical quantities are positive and in those cases you will have quadratic forms which are positive and therefore you will get positive definite matrices so for example you see that in structural systems in solid mechanics where the stiffness matrix is typically positive definite and the fourier natural frequencies are positive definite so again there is a simpler way to actually find out if a matrix is uh, positive definite or not and that simply is by looking at the eigen values of the matrix so you can see here it is positive definite if all these lambda i are greater than 0 positive definite if all are greater than 0 and at least one may be equal to 0 negative definite if all are less than 0 negative semi definite if all are less than 0 and one is 0 uh, one or more is 0 and it is indefinite if these are both positive and negative so this is essentially a way to simply calculate the form of a matrix now this particular thing will become very important later we will see in some of the optimization criteria now essentially let us go back to the quadratic form here and now it is expressed in terms of the symmetric matrix so if we take the first derivative of the quadratic form we essentially get this equation which is the gradient of the quadratic form is ax and if we take the second derivative of the quadratic form we get the hessian matrix so this is something which is very important that as far as the quadratic forms are concerned the second derivative is the hessian matrix and therefore we will be very concerned about the positive definiteness or negative definiteness of the hessian matrix as it relates to various optimality criteria so essentially today's lecture we have looked at the taylor series expansion and then we have come to the quadratic form and we have 
also figured out how the gradient and edge matrix are related to the quadratic form. So essentially now you have some of the basic background in terms of understanding the nomenclature which is used in various optimization algorithms. So that is the end of lecture two and I will see you in my next video. Thank you very much.